Welcome to the show from wherever you're watching. It's great to have you with us. We're talking private equity this week and its role in transforming the African continent. We have amazing guests discussing this and we get your views on the issues. As always, we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Geshuru. Our guests this week are incredible women who are pioneers in their respective fields. And they share their views with us on the role of private equity in transforming the African continent and the role they are playing as well. Let's take a look at their profiles. On the show this week, we feature Wendy Luhabe. She co-founded the Women Investment Portfolio Holdings, the first female-owned company to be listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and pioneered another first for South Africa by launching the Multi-Million Private Equity Fund for Women-Owned Enterprises. She is an avid advocate of social entrepreneurship and strongly believes in the potential of human capital and an author. Wendy was awarded one of the 50 leading women entrepreneurs of the world and global leader of tomorrow of the World Economics Forum. Dr. Franny Lautel. She is currently a partner and chief executive officer of the Mkoba Private Equity Fund in Tanzania. Mkoba offers a unique opportunity for investors to participate in private equity investments in sub-Saharan Africa with a focus on five key sectors, agribusiness and processing, services and manufacturing, urban renewal, financial services, innovative ideas in renewable energy and ICT. Franny has held various positions at the World Bank including Director Infrastructure, Vice President and Head World Bank Institute, Chief of Staff to the President. Now let's get straight to their views on the issue. are analyzing private equity in Africa. Now, it's a fact that the potential of private equity to transform the African continent is exponential. We're very happy to have with us Wendy Luhabe and Franny Lotier. Welcome, ladies. Wendy, let me start with you. In 2002, you funded the Women Private Equity Fund. Uh, it invests primarily or has been investing in women-owned businesses. What was the opportunity there that you saw and, and what was your experience in that area? Uh, the Women's Fund was a pioneering fund and it was established to achieve a number of objectives. The first one was to respond to a funding gap in the market. Women were going to the banks to look for funding and the banks were not interested. You know, the banks unfortunately still regard women as a risk. The second objective was to grow women-owned enterprises from small enterprises to the medium sector. Because it's only when you grow that you're able to increase your capacity to create more employment. And the third objective was to create additional employment opportunities. What were the challenges that you faced? Raising the capital was a challenge. Mm -hmm. It took us almost two years to raise the capital. Private sector was not interested at all, so ultimately we were able to raise the money from institutional funds, like pension funds which I think is the case with, uh, with Franny as well. So it was really convincing the, the financial services sector that this was a necessary intervention and that there was a need in the market to focus, to create a gender-focused fund, and that women were already in business and, and that for their businesses to grow, they needed to have access to capital. And of course, What's really fantastic with private equity is that it doesn't just provide equity, it also brings in the business experience to help to improve the financial performance of these companies, to grow them and to strengthen management capacity. Which, which would be critical for, for any business and certainly for the small and micro-sized businesses on the continent. Franny, let me come to you. And this year, um, Mkoba Private Equity Fund launched and this is a 300 million US dollar uh, fund. Uh, what do you aim to achieve at Mkoba? Well, Julie, it's a pleasure to uh, be here. And um, Mkoba was launched in April in this year, so very recently. And what we aim to achieve is to invest in small and medium enterprises that are 
either African owned or African managed that need capital between one million and fifteen million dollars, which is very difficult to get in the current market situation, and to help those companies not only grow in their industries or in their sectors, but to create jobs and generate uh, technology leapfrogs in areas that are of importance to Africa, and of course because we're a private equity fund to make a, a good financial return so we can reinvest in the next uh, batch of companies that we take up. What's unique, would you say, about Nkoba? Well, first of all, we are the first private equity fund of its size to be headquartered in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, so that makes us quite unique. Uh, secondly, the majority shareholding structure for the general partner is Tanzanian, uh, 70%. Uh, third, we have two women as partners, and the head of the organization is also a woman. There are, I think, only globally 7% of private equity funds are headed by women. So Wendy and I are in a rather unusual oh, group. Yeah, a very small face. setting. <laughs> that's what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's it. And I think we are also unique in the approach we are taking mm -hmm. because we want to succeed not only in, in making a return, which is very important for private equity, but also in growing successful companies that are good for the countries in which we invest. Meaning they're tackling either a sectoral issue like health or industry like uh, payment systems in the, in the banking sector, or they are helping a, a country uh, create lots of jobs, because currently very few jobs are created by the companies that exist, so that the footprint that we leave behind is something that has an impact community-wide and not just for the companies in which we invest. Well, ladies, let me ask you this. For people watching who have a sense of what, what private equity is but may have questions, how do you break it down in, in a very simplified form for people to understand what exactly is private equity? Wendy? It's raising capital from either individuals mm -hmm. or from institutional funds, so like pension funds. They're generally the kinds of institutions that would uh, invest in a private equity fund. And it's generally to to invest, as, as Franny was saying, in sectors of the market that are underfunded mm -hmm. or that are not considered to be a priority investment in, in, the, in the funding space. They are also generally created to, to, to address areas of the market that are neglected. You know, so either underfunded or, or neglected. Mm -hmm. Some people would argue that the banks have ignored these areas because they are high risk. What would your response be? I think there's a, there's a good portion of the argument that is true. Uh, because small and medium enterprises, uh, many of them don't have proper accounting procedures, so they can't document and show to the banks that they are profitable. A uh, few of them have written down strategies for growth, so again with the bank looking at uh, future pr trajectories, they probably uh, don't see any documentation on that. The owners would know that this is where I want to go and they are always successful many times, but they can't document that all the time to the banks. So when the banks look at them, they see them as a big risk. And I think the third risk is that the, the current interest rates for growth capital are very, very steep for some of the small and medium enterprises. So private equity plays a good role in three ways. First, if you get private equity to your, f to your firm, uh, the, the investors become shareholders and then they sell their shares when they exit. And that's the beauty of private equity because you have to exit. Mm -hmm. That means you are not holding those shares for a long period of time. You hold them five, six years and then you exit. Uh, so that helps these entrepreneurs to get money where for five years they don't need to worry about repaying a loan to the bank, which can be quite expensive to service debts given the revenue stream they have. And many times these investments are capital investments that are needed for growth. And during that period of investing, your, your revenue stream hasn't kicked in yet. So with a delay in the way the revenue stream comes on board, private equity gives them breathing room that allows them to grow that uh, revenue stream over time. And by the time you exit, of course, the business is valued much higher because it has uh, taken maybe a new strategy, uh, invested in building capacity, taken on new markets, and therefore it's more valuable than before 
the investment uh, has, was made. And then the third area which private equity brings is the discipline of good business management. Because the companies we invest in uh, are our companies because we own shares in them. So we, we put a lot of effort working with management and the ownership to improve the performance of the company's productivity, uh, strategy, business strategy, uh, improving the accounts. And when we exit, therefore, these become very good investments for banks because the companies then have precisely the things that banks would be looking for. But maybe the, the last area is that they become very good investments for other investors who are looking to invest bigger money than we are, uh, because these companies then grow. So they could uh, come of them, uh, some of them maybe issue a local IPO, uh, and then after a few years cross list in a bigger capital market. So the ones who could list, say, here in the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange can in a few years cross-list with Johannesburg and slowly grow to become regional giants. And I think this is really the trajectory that we see uh, for private equity. An, an incredible good news story because there we're talking about, and, and many people watching will, will relate to the struggle of paying interest on bank loans, uh, the issue of skills building, capacity building within the companies, and then growth, growth. So you don't stay at micro, uh, at small business level, move upwards. What are the greatest challenges, though, that you face um, in private equity um, in Africa? Well, the first one, which I'd already mentioned, is raising the capital itself. I'm sure Freni will confirm she's just raised a huge fund, and it, it, it was very challenging, especially in my case, because it was a gender-focused fund, and people didn't really believe that it was necessary. Definitely the, the traditional banks and funding institutions just did not understand why we needed to raise a gender-focused fund. Do you think that perspective has shifted? It probably has, okay. because it was a pioneering fund, so when we raised the fund, this was unheard of. But, um, you know, and I guess that's the price that you pay when you pioneer. You establish the foundation and you build the track record that helps future efforts like mm -hmm. what Freni is now doing, that there's now proof that a concept of this nature okay. not only has a market, but it's actually necessary and it can work. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess that private equity is where micro lending was when it started, you know, where people didn't believe that lending to micro enterprises was a viable business. And it's proven over the years that not only is it necessary, it's a profitable business it and it fills a very critical social need. And so I think that that's how private equity is, is really developing because developing enterprise development in Africa is such a critical intervention that is necessary for us to build the foundation that will grow, as, as Freni was saying, the, the, the industrial giants that are going to, you know, because private, I mean, private sector in, in any economy is such a critical pillar mm -hmm. of providing stability, providing uh, employment, and providing a, um, a, um, a stepping stone for the economies of the various African countries and economies to grow. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Let's look at government policy for a moment. Um, you know, is there anything that you would suggest needs to be looked at, amended? Um, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I think uh, that comes sometimes to the challenges that you mentioned, and I think Wendy has captured very well the fundraising challenge mm -hmm. because for first-time funds, it's very difficult to get fun uh, funding. Uh, because there's a checklist for most investors and they want to see track record. So if you're a first-time fund and you don't have collective track record, then they look at whether the people who are running the fund have that track record of investing. And for this sector that we're looking at, very few people actually have track record because by definition these were not funded previously. So there's very little experience out there in investing in these types of companies. The, the challenges on the policy front uh, have to do with property rights. Mm -hmm. In many of the countries we invest in, uh, property rights are, are, have to be secured. And that brings it to the design of your team, to make sure you have people who actually know the local market, who live 
in those countries and therefore know what the constraints may be. Uh, the countries we're investing in, many of them were uh, socialist countries or still are, and therefore land is owned by the state and therefore investing uh, when you need large amounts of land requires permitting and, and leasing. And these leasing arrangements need to be secure. And there I think the government has a very important role to make sure that those land markets work properly. And we're very happy to see that a number of countries have gone through land reform of that nature, including Tanzania. I mean, in Kenya, you've had a very lively land market uh, with secondary sales, uh, tertiary sales, and, and so on. South Africa so as some well. There's progress. There is a lot of progress, but it remains a challenge in a pocket of countries. The second big one has to do with the processes for registering companies and how easy and speedy those are. Mm -hmm. Uh, because for some of these small and medium enterprises, uh, merging with an informal company that has been doing very well in a segment of a market that is of importance to, to the growth strategy, uh, bringing those vehicles into uh, an existing company takes time in some environments. So I think here countries can learn from each other. For example, it took us exactly one day to register in Rwanda. So, I mean, uh, registration processes in countries vary. So with, with companies like ours that need to operate in different environments, being able to invest not only in Tanzania, uh, but also in the other nine countries in which we invest, mm -hmm. requires that ease of doing business uh, so that investments can move ahead. The third one is more on the supporting infrastructure that would help those companies succeed. Take agribusiness companies. They all rely on transport and logistics, some of them cold chain logistics to take fruit, say from Lushoto to Dar es Salaam, or as many Kenyan trucks are now coming to buy fruit in Lushoto, where I come from. Uh, and by the time these fruits get to Nairobi or Mombasa, they are sort of deteriorated. So the cold chain logistics that are needed to support that value chain or uh, processing uh, for uh, canning and bottling juices and jams and uh, fruit preserves. Those kind of investments rely heavily on transport infrastructure, but also to some degree on industrialization. So the, the investments that the government can make in prioritizing the types of infrastructure that would help these companies to grow, I think would be very important. And maybe the last one is more on the on the tax regime, because many companies remain informal because it's very onerous to pay taxes. So simplifying for the smaller companies the forms that they need to fill in order to, to be compliant in the tax area. And here I'm very happy to say in a country like Tanzania, for example, when you look at the mobile payment systems, once a company is registered and you have an agent who is a, a, an agent who deals in the mobile payment, they get registered and then they automatically pay taxes at the end of every month and so on. And this process of registration helps to formalize the informal sector. And it's very important to be able to do this in countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, to improve and learn from each other, to take what works uh, in South Africa and implement it in Mozambique and, and uh, what has been working very well in the Ivory Coast to bring it uh, to the Tanzania or using what Ethiopia is doing and, and, and uh, implementing that uh, in Kenya or in, in Tanzania and so on. So I think we can uh, uh, bring those lessons and that's the role that private equity plays because we invest in companies that eventually succeed. Mm -hmm the policies that support that success can be shared across countries and we can learn from each other. And, and that sharing is something that we've been discussing, I think, as a continent more and more now, is, is what can we learn and share um, uh, with each other. Uh, Wendy? And I think what's been missing, if I may just mm -hmm. add, is, is the creation of an ecosystem mm -hmm. that combines all of these elements into one place and makes it accessible and, and able to take from one market to another market, as Franny was just saying. Because that's what's missing. We have various elements that are required, but we haven't developed an ecosystem. 
Okay. Definitely not in South Africa. I don't know about Tanzania, but I suspect it's throughout the continent. It's a similar situation. Let's come to the fact that, I mean, over the past 10 years, uh, the inflows in terms of private equity into the continent have certainly increased, but they're still a fraction of what we see mm -hmm. on the global stage, presumably because of the challenges that we've been articulating here. But looking at the pattern of growth and development, could you project for us where we are headed and what transformational effect that could have on the continent? Well, I think the growth, you know, the fact that Africa is regarded as the next frontier mm -hmm. globally is certainly a huge advantage for, for opportunities like private equity. But secondly, we, we need to begin to integrate private equity as part of the education system. It's not well, it's not part of our education system currently, and therefore it's not understood by Africans themselves. Mm -hmm. The third opportunity that I see is that it could offer a way for us to do business with each other. One of the discussions that came up in this African Leadership Forum is the fact that we're still not trading with each other. And I think private equity could offer a, a very convenient vehicle mm -hmm. for us to begin to invest in each other's economies and begin to share best practice and share the business experience that we have in different markets of and the back continent. to the ecosystems yes, that we create across, right. across the board. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on this one? I think Wendy raises an excellent point on, on how we can support intra-regional trade using investments in private equity. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the key uh, bottlenecks is energy. So the countries that are energy rich can grow a cluster of companies that benefit from that richness in energy and then create trade across countries that are poor in energy. Because energy is one of the biggest bottlenecks we face here, especially for manufacturing, which is a very energy intensive uh, sector. So I think the intra-regional trade, the specialization that is needed so that competition is one thing, but specialization helps different kinds of companies to grow. And when you think of a value chain, if you take, for example, uh, cashew nuts, uh, cashew nuts can be used to produce up mm -hmm. to six or seven different products. But in Africa, we grow them, mm -hmm. we, export we export them, them. and that's, that's it. Right. We could make animal feed. That's a whole new different business. We could extract the oil and use it for cosmetics, mm -hmm. a whole new business. Mm -hmm. We could use the husks to make uh, briquettes that can be used for biomass instead of charcoal, mm -hmm. a completely different business. So when you think through these value chains and you think through the countries that can specialize in one or other of the segments, for instance, you have a very advanced cosmetic industry in Western Africa and Southern mm -hmm. Africa, then there's no need really to build that kind of company in Eastern Africa. On the other hand, East Africa may be a great place to make animal feed because mm -hmm. of the richness of the uh, a heritage of raising animals in, in this part of, of Africa. So those are some of the things that one could uh, help happen and that would create tremendous intra-regional trade because you would need to to be buying from one company or the other and these companies would grow, they'd create jobs and uh, more importantly they would provide exciting opportunities in sectors that young people are not going to right now, like mm. agriculture. Say, okay, mm. I'm growing cashew nuts. Okay, that's one. If you tell your friends, I'm growing cashew nuts and I'm making the latest cosmetic, you know, that's it. Then it becomes even, exciting. Exactly. <laughs> it so. transforms the game. So, you know, um, the challenges, and I guess, you know, my final question, let me pose this challenge. Do, do African governments realize, you know, the role that private equity can play? Are they supportive? of this role? Uh, and finally, which other stakeholders would you say are critical? You mentioned education and the curriculums. Which other stakeholders do you see as critical towards coming together and ensuring that this happens? And not in the long term, even in the short and medium term, it starts transforming the continent. Fanny, I'll start with you. And then with you. We've received tremendous uh, uh, success and, and, and encouragement and support from governments. Here in Tanzania, when we launched in April this year, President Kikwete came for the launch. We had the Prime Minister all day with us and a large number of ministers, as well as the Governor of the Central Bank of Tanzania came. Uh, we launched in Kigali, also at the uh, ADB annual meetings. Uh, we had very good meetings with President Kagame, with key members of his cabinet. The uh, Rwanda Development Board organized a follow-up meeting. 
We had the pension funds there. We had the insurance industry, the banks, the central bank as well. And uh, we are launching now soon in Ethiopia, and we again are getting tremendous support from the Ethiopian government. We have uh, President, uh, former President Obasanjo on our advisory uh, team, and he's helping us uh, with uh, uh, diplomacy across Africa, and that's giving us tremendous uh, support as well. So I think governments are very keen in supporting uh, private equity. Uh, the other stakeholders we need are the banks, because uh, when you arrange these private equity uh, investments, there are segments of them that you may need loans for. And having a private equity partner gives the banks comfort. Right. So the banks are willing to come then with, with debt for some of the investments. And so we need the banks. The, the central banks are very important as well because they are uh, currency transactions, especially if you are investing outside uh, in multiple countries, uh, like say Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, then you need to have uh, some uh, uh, understanding of where the currencies are going to go and then knowing what the central banks are projecting and so on helps a great deal. Uh, there is also the um, uh, important uh, need to work with the capital market authorities and the stock markets because of the exit uh, phase, which is very, very critical. Uh, that's how private equity makes money in most of the world is when they exit mm -hmm. and when you are able to sell either in the stock market, issue an IPO and so on. But the ones that I think are also really critical, particularly for innovation and uncovering new companies, are these uh, investment centers, like the Tanzanian Investment Center. Right. Almost every country has, has these mm. investment centers, because that's where people go when they're looking for funding. And the one area also, I think, is, for example, Wendy and I could work together, because some of the, I think 40% of the companies that are SMEs are owned by women. So there are opportunities also to work across funds, and those are critical stakeholders to, to build. So there are quite a number, but let me, uh, these are just a few, because I'm sure, yeah. That's an amazing array of stakeholders. Your thoughts, Wendy? I think the two that I would probably add uh, mm -hmm. are a way of targeting young people, because mm -hmm. we youth. know that the established industry is not going to be providing adequate employment opportunities to absorb all of them. Right. Mm. The incubation centers, and I think that a lot of countries are beginning to develop incubation mm -hmm. centers and innovation hubs that are looking at new, new ideas and looking at ideas that are responding to the social challenges, which is an area that young people are very attracted to. Mm -hmm. They don't want just to create enterprises for the sake of enterprises. I'm seeing a lot of young people who are creating businesses that are really responding to the challenges of the continent, right. which is very exciting. Right. Finally, um, literally in less than a minute, are you optimistic, looking forward at the potential? Are you optimistic? I'm extremely optimistic because, uh, you know, when I hear, I didn't know about what Fren is doing. To raise a $300 million fund mm. in Africa is unprecedented. To, to actually be, and to be raised from Africa. That for me is what is exciting, mm -hmm. and that's really what is quite revolutionary. Because a lot of the private equity funds that are in the continent are generally raised from outside of the continent. Right. So this is a very encouraging sign, and I think it, it really bears testament to the fact that Africans themselves are beginning to recognize that if we don't invest in the economy of the continent, we will actually lose the, 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 the benefits. benefits of the growth of you know, opportunities that uh, the economy is offering. Franny, are you optimistic? I'm very optimistic, uh, partly for the reason that Wendy mentioned, that mm -hmm. Africans are now beginning to see the value of investing in their own uh, companies and in their own countries. And uh, we've started with the pension funds, which are the ones that really are growing tremendously. They have a lot of money and they are they are becoming uh, big players in this market. But I think for me, the optimism comes in knowing that private equity in the way we are doing it could be one of the ways to achieve a common shared future. And we can have a common shared future in terms of the, the land that we all come from and, and live on and, and, and support in terms of the security of the earth and the protection of uh, the natural resources like the land and the animals and so on but also in investing in growing the kind of services and products that we all need 
And for me, the optimism comes from knowing we can do that differently, that we don't have to make the mistakes that other countries have made. We can leapfrog ahead and, and do that uh, in a different way, in an African way. In an African yeah. way. <laughs> Professor Ali Mazuri puts it really beautifully. He says that um, Africans consume products that they don't produce, and they produce cons products that they, they export, do, that, that they, they export don't consume. Out. You know, so I think that what Tren is describing is actually correcting that. We can transform, we yeah. can transform the situation. Thank you so much, ladies, and thank you also for being at the forefront of transforming this continent. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure. Thank Julie. you. Thank you, Julie. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Fascinating insights. I hope you've learned something and that you can benefit perhaps from reaching out to private equity groups and perhaps getting an injection of capital from them. Um, now, let's get your views on the issues. This week, we asked you, how can Africa source and utilize funds from the increasing number of private equity funds in the continent? William Radido says, Africa can source funds from existing businesses through equal taxation of African industries and utilize it on mentorship of young entrepreneurs. Hi, my name is Eric Njaroge, watching ALD from Nairobi. I think what you need to do in order to source and utilize funds from private equity firms being set up in Africa is first of all to put up economic policies that will encourage entrepreneurship, especially amongst young people. Secondly, is to have visionary leaders who will be able to distribute these funds across the country and across the region. And thirdly, is to put up, is to put up institutions that can help curb or fight corruption. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. And on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. Time now for Africa's Top 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we feature Africa's Top Private Equity Funds. Starting us off at number 10 is Axis. Founded in 2006, Axis has invested at least $10 million in Africa, predominantly in the infrastructure sector. Coming in at number 9 is Development Partners International. Founded in 2007, DPI has invested $30 million in Africa, mostly in the manufacturing, IT, and construction sectors. Positioned at number 8 is the Duet Group. The group has vested interests in food retail and manufacturing sectors mostly in West Africa, investing more than $50 million in those particular projects. At number 7 is the Equita Capital Partners. Founded in 2003, they invest exclusively in banks and other financial institutions, pumping in approximately $100 million in Africa to help develop economies throughout the continent. Taking the number 6 spot is Fertiza. Currently operating across Sub-Saharan Africa, Fertiza focuses on food security and affordable housing and up to date, it has invested approximately $285 million in those two sectors. Slotted in at number 5 is Afric Invest. Founded in 1994, it offers its services to most of the African countries in the financial, agribusiness, education and healthcare dockets, investing more than $1 billion. Emerging Capital Partners comes in at number 4. Founded in the year 2000, it has invested more than $2 billion in African companies, most notably the likes of Nairobi Java House, Kenya's leading cafe and continental reinsurance company, Nigeria's largest reinsurance company. Positioned at number 3 is Actis. Founded in 2004, Actis has vested interests in private equity, energy and real estate in Africa and currently has $7 billion worth of investments under management. Ashburton Investments takes the number two spot. The group offers clients access to unique investment opportunities not previously available to retail or institutional investors in Africa. It has assets exceeding $13 billion under their management. And at number one this week is Investec. 
the group provides a wide range of financial products and services to its clients and is one of the largest third-party investors in Africa with over $37 billion in Pan-African assets invested across public and private equity firms. And that is Africa's Top 10 this week. We've already come to the end of the show. It's always a pleasure to be with you on the Africa Leadership Dialogues and we leave you with a Ghanaian proverb. A healthy person who begs for food is an insult to a generous farmer. Blessings to you and blessings to him.